My name is Nigel Theobald. I'm the CEO of N4 Pharma. Um, and I'm here today just to give an update on the business and an overview presentation. So some of you may have seen bits of this before um, because we did something late last year. Um, but there's also some updates on where, where we've got to this year. So we were established in 2014, listed last year on AIM through a company called Onzima Ventures. We have two divisions, one focused on reformulation of generic drugs, and the other is a delivery system for vaccines and therapeutics, look, focusing on DNA and RNA systems. Both of which, though, have a very similar business model, which is about a low risk, low cost, quick route to market. So we're not about large pharma, multi-million investments with just one particular aspect of a drug that will fail a clinical trial and then it all goes wrong. So we have multiple different opportunities. In the generics business, our first product is a, a reformulation of uh, sildenafil, which is the generic name for Viagra. And in the vaccine business, we have uh, Nuvec, which is our delivery system for DNA and RNA vaccines. Both of those are progressing very well. And they're all built on a very strong portfolio, intellectual property portfolio, and we have a very strong management team. So the business model is basically to take an unmet patient need, an unmet clinical need, look at an area where we can improve and quickly come up with a solution that means we can start to get a commercial licensing revenue from that. So we take a product that maybe has a slight, well, maybe it's not a, a fault, but it needs improving, or we're working with delivery systems to actually get DNA and RNA into the particular cell that is required. Once we have that, we either license that product through to a pharma company, or we license the use of that delivery system to a pharma company for their own programs with their own DNA and RNA vaccines. So where are we from a year ago? Well, and the good news, um, we're about 200, over 200% 200 up on our share price. And I like to think that's because we set out a very clear program of what we're going to achieve over the next three years. It was three, two years now from where we were, three years from the start. And we're actually managing to deliver on that, that performance. So we have commenced our in vivo work on NUVEC, um, and that's giving us some very good results, which has allowed us to have a very early collaboration with one of the largest companies in this space called Medimune. We've now appointed Andrew Leishman, ex AstraZeneca, as our head of NUVEC development. And we are in clinic with sildenafil. So we've just started our first proof of concept human trials with sildenafil. So all in all, we're in a very strong cash position because since the RTO, we've actually had another near 800,000 from this year in warrants exercised, which have actually been traded within that share price growth. So underlying our share price is in a very strong position and we have a lot of cash that will see us through our program to 2019. So a bit on sildenafil. Um, you may or may not know that sildenafil is originally a heart drug. Its side effect profile led to the formation of this erectile dysfunction category. The issues around Viagra as it stands as the leading drug is it basically isn't perfect for, it wasn't designed for that, that group. And as a side effect, it has issues in terms of it takes an hour before it starts to work. And it only lasts for about five or six hours and slows down rapidly if you take it with food. So as a consequence, other companies came out with um, products for Cialis focusing on longer lasting, uh, other products focusing just on the, the faster acting element of the performance profile that wasn't working for Viagra. We're actually designing something that works both quickly in terms of a fast onset of action and stays longer than six hours. So you have a better profile because what consumers want is they want a normal sex life when taking this product. And that's the most important thing that we see from why we're trying to reformulate. What you see on the uh, graph there is there's this thing called a therapeutic range. And for Viagra to work, the drug needs to be in your body with sufficient levels, but not too much. Too little, it won't be having an effect. Too much, it'll be having serious side effects. And say, Viagra, the gray area takes about an hour before it starts to work. So you see it takes a little while to build up, reaches a peak, and then goes down fairly quickly and lasts about six hours. What we're doing is reformulating that drug, just basically using sildenafil, so nothing, we're not adding anything new to it, we're just taking it and reformulating it so it starts to work quicker, so it gets above the bottom of the threshold, so it starts to be therapeutically active quicker, and then it lasts for longer. I talk about it like the sort of, the geographic leeward sloping mountain of Viagra, we're replacing it with Ayers Rock. So that's the sort of profile that we've got. And how do we do that? So our product, 
is a core coat patented product for this particular space. So we have an inner core of sildenafil citrate with 80% uh, of the product in there and then an outer coat which has got sildenafil base. And it has sildenafil base in because it helps with our taste profile of that product. And what happens is you put the tablet under your tongue for 60 seconds, an element of the outer coat will dissolve in, under the tongue and go through what's called the buccal wafer and into the bloodstream, but bypassing the stomach. And that's what gives it the rapid onset. The tablet is then swallowed and it behaves normally until the, the core then kicks in, and which is delivered over a longer period of time in the upper intestine. So that's basically how our formulation works. As I mentioned, we are now in the clinic. So we are doing a 12-person uh, crossover, four-way crossover study. So we're comparing our tablet, both fed and fasted, to Viagra. And that will allow us to measure that red line, basically, so we can see, are we above the line early enough? And do we maintain that red line for long enough? And that's what the clinical trial is set to measure. Results of that will be due out around about the uh, early come in July, but they'll be in uh, mid to late August. We set out this plan. So we started out with our in vitro work. We've then moved into the clinic now. We're very much on track. The next step is for us to take those results, check the profile, and go sit down with the FDA and the regulators to say, what do we do next for a pivotal trial? So that's our key value inflection for sildenafil. So based on those results, are we going to actually do a license deal early, or are we going to then look at taking the product through to market ourselves, where if we do an early license, we might get maybe 5 or 6% royalty. If we do a, our own marketing authorization, we'll probably get upwards of 10%. So it's far more value creating if we get to marketing authorization ourselves, but we're looking at maybe two to three million to actually get that study into the market. So again, it's back to our model, low risk, low rewards. We're not talking hundreds of millions. We're not changing the efficacy of the product. We're just looking at a reformulation. And the regulatory pathway for the US is something called 505B2, which means it's a cheap process to actually get it into marketing authorization. So that's still Denafil. So I'll take you through Nuvec, our delivery system. And what it is, is a small nano hollow particle, they call it a mesoporous silica particle. And it basically is designed as an alternative to a lipid nano system or a viral vector. And the way we've done that is that the, the key benefits that we're looking to try to achieve, we can get a real high loading of DNA and RNA onto um, our particle. We've demonstrated excellent transve transvection is the process by where it passes through into the cell to allow the uh, DNA to do its thing. We have demonstrated that we don't get any payload leakage. Uh, we then protect our, the DNA on its journey. And importantly, it's, we have excellent preclinical tolerability, which is really important. So somebody, anybody that we want to partner with is going to look at our preclinical package and say, does it cause any issues? Does it cause any unwanted side effects? And importantly for us, it doesn't track to the liver. And I'll, get, I'll explain a little bit more, which is one of the key benefits. It keeps it localized. So a lot of people developing lipid systems end up in the liver and they don't want to be in that particular place. Great if you're developing liver cancer, but for other things, you don't want to actually be there. And this is how it works. So it was, it, you can see these little gray photo is a, 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 tele, a TEM image of the actual particles. And it was these, inspired by this thing called the Rambutan fruit. If ever you've traveled Asia, you'll know what that looks like. And what it is, is this hollow silica sphere that has got these spikes grown on the edge. And the spikes basically allow the DNA to trap and stick to the particle. It's very difficult to get DNA, which has got this loopy-like structure, to stick to a solid sphere. And in, in essence, what our particle does is it dramatically increases the surface area of that particle, which is why we can get such a high loading onto the particle. So this hollow sphere then traps the DNA, and the spikes will ultimately dissolve and then release the DNA. So it's quite a simple process, um, but it's that unique structure, that spiky structure, that gives us the point of difference compared to the, all the lipid systems that tend to be more solid. A little bit of technology here. It works a little bit like a bit of sticky Velcro. Because of the, the spikes, it'll stick to the side of the cell. The cell will then envelop the particle and it draws it in through this process called penocytosis. And once inside the cell, it then releases the contents into the cytoplasm within the cell. And basically the nucleic acid then comes away from the particle 
and allows the, the therapeutic proteins to be produced. Once it's done its job, the particle then dissolves naturally and, and converts to silic acid in the body and just disappears. So there's nothing left around, which is what is giving us quite a lot of excitement about how it can be used because, as I say, it's localized, it disappears, it doesn't stay, it doesn't hang around, it doesn't cause unwanted side effects. So we've been looking at a whole load of different research this year based on the, the funds that we raised on float. Um, we've shown the transfection work, we've shown how it works in terms of the toxicity. So as I mentioned, there's no major toxicity by using our product. Um, we've shown that it doesn't track into the liver. We've shown that it doesn't cause unwanted cytokine responses, which is the sort of side effects from um, putting certain particles into the body. We're also doing a whole load of work at the moment on DNA. We've men I mentioned Medimmune. So Medimmune are doing a lot of work on RNA as well as DNA. So we're, we're focusing our internal research on DNA, looking at dose response, looking at elements of the, the, the actual immune response, stability of the particle, how long does it take before the spikes break down in the body, where do they go? And also looking at all the stability effect of the final product and toxicology tests that we have to do. Um, what we're basically are looking to do is to be ready to partner with somebody who wants to go into clinic. And the reason we're excited is because this is a big, big space to work in. So the nanotechnology market is forecast to grow to around 178 billion. Obviously, we're, it's, that's a huge market and cancer vaccines and DNA is going to be a, you know, a big part of that. And it's a massive deal space. Just one example of a deal that can be done. We're talking about huge upfront milestone payments, huge royalties. And as I mentioned earlier, we're about a multi-platform opportunity. We're not looking at just one solution. So we're looking to work with a number of different partners that all have the potential. So we're de-risking our business by not taking on the full risk. So we're going to work with a number of partners who are taking their products into clinic. And then they'll ultimately give us royalties if they're successful. So if one of them fails, that's not the end of our business because we'll still be earning money as they go through the clinic and then we'll be earning money from those that are successful that come through with royalties. The business model, as I mentioned, the three-year plan, ultimately we, we want to be ready to partner with companies that are going into the clinic. So we're not going to take our own DNA vaccines into clinics spending hundreds of millions. There are lots of companies out there that are spending hundreds of millions getting products into clinic and they're with DNA and RNA, they're struggling for a number of different reasons and we think our vector is going to help overcome a lot of those. So if we can show that our vector is the right way to get into clinic, then that's the right way that you ultimately get a product to market. We've already announced our first collaboration with Medimmune, which for me is quite ahead of where we wanted to be this time. So we're already well up on our um, development plan. We're looking to do other collaborations for the rest of this year before we then look to really broad and once we've done our own and finished our research to be able to say exactly how it's going to work we can then start to broaden the collaboration agreements that we're looking to establish. It's not just DNA and RNA vaccines and therapeutics. We can work in a number of different areas. We can work with um, antibodies. We can work with antibiotics. We can work with immunotherapy. We're focusing at the moment on DNA and RNA because as a small company, we can't do everything all at once. But having established one or two of our, our product, we can then start to broaden into other areas. So a bit of a summary. Say we have two divisions. We have um, a very targeted, significant, addressable markets. We have multiple opportunities. And those collaboration, that's quite important. People think just because we've done one deal with Medimmune doesn't mean that's it. We can work, many of you can be just one, we can work with a number of different people. We can do therapeutic license for one area, we can do another license for another therapeutic area. So we have multiple opportunities to collaborate and that's how we de-risk that part of the NUVEC business. We have other products in the generic, so we're working with Sildenafil. Once we get the results from Sildenafil, that will help inform the in vitro formulation work that we need to do for the other products. So we're not rushing into clinic with all three products, but we'll be able to do reformulation of those based on how we see that profile work for sildenafil. So that gives us our low risk, low cost route to market. Um, I mentioned again that we are backed by very strong intellectual property. It's very important we have four patents going through for our generics division and this license from University of Queensland for the, the vaccine technology that under review is very strong. And a highly experienced management team. So we have a strong team 
at the board level and we work with a huge range of consultants. We're a virtual company, so we don't have a lot of employees. There's six of us in the business, but if you add the number of people that are working on our projects, there's about 25 to 30 people who are working on it, but they're all outsourced to different contract research labs, contract manufacturing labs, so it keeps our cost base really low, and we're only spending money on delivering products and technology that can be lead to license agreements. That's our business model. Develop it to a point where it's commercially able to be um, to be to, to earn revenue. And I mentioned the early collaboration with Medimoon, which for us is very important because even though we're still halfway through our research program, we've excited Medimoon enough to be able to say they want to have a look at our technology to see how it works. So that's N4. So that's the year we've had, and gives you a bit of an oversight as to who we are. Hi, I have actually three sort of questions, if you don't mind. Um, Obviously, the Viagra formulation, uh, you're competing with the four other drugs that are on the market, and they all have various benefits and you have various advantages, but I believe that all those other drugs come off patent in about three years' time, by the time you'd be coming to market. So how do you think that would affect? Okay, well, Vi Viagra is off patent in Europe now. And it's coming off patent in the US very, very soon. Yeah, but your competitors so come off patent as well. The comp our competitors. The, the other four drugs. That the other four drugs, Cialis will be coming off patent this year and the others will be later on. So these will all be then generic products. So Stender and you know, the generic version of that will be doing nothing. I mean, you, the only two that really matter are Cialis and Viagra because they're the ones that are the big volume players in the market. Our product will be patent protected. So it can, when it comes to market, it'll have a premium. In all our valuation, we're looking at somewhere around a doubling of the price of the generic. So somewhere between the generic price and 100% premium on that. Now, we say we're not marketing that product ourselves. We'll be licensing that to a partner who have got the ability to work with that, that, that pricing structure. Yeah. Uh, the second question was that uh, Medimmune, I believe they're a wholly owned subsidiary of AstraZeneca. That's that? correct, yes. And in the RNS, it gave some sort of vague comment that they would have the right to buy and take it off you or take the pr that process forward. It didn't obviously reveal any figures. Was that just a bit of bull for AstraZeneca's sake or uh, uh, do you have actually agreed with them some financial basis? No, what we've done is we've agreed that they, the, the work that we do in the collaboration, we, we own all the results. They can then take those results forward and license those results for a particular area that they want to look, look into. We can't say what that area is. Um, but it, it will be one specific area which frees us up to go and do other collaboration deals with anybody else. Fine, thank you. And finally, uh, in what areas of the world have you applied for patents for the Viagra reformulation and is your license for NuVec a worldwide license? Yes. Second question, yes. <laughs> it's a worldwide license exclusively for all hum human therapeutic use and animal vaccines as well for, uh, for DNA and RNA animal vaccines. And on our patents, we've gone with the, the top five. So, and a few others. So, Europe, USA, Japan, China, India, and uh, on top of that, also Australia and Canada. Just because I like those two and they're quite cheap. I would say I bought your shares at 8p, so I'm well very done. happy. Well done. Thank you. Um, could I ask does the IP uh, protect you? Uh, we, we've got a, a sildenafil citrate in a fast dissolving outside shell, and then we've got the sildenafil base for the long acting bit. Other way around. Uh, other way, way around. around yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, does does your IP protect anybody else doing a similar but um, not identical? Uh, composition no, of yes it does because we have a very broad patent application going through that is what that is the specific product that we have now but we can use different version combinations of the other way around we could do you wouldn't use citrate because it's so bitter you wouldn't be able to put it in the outer core we could we've got patents pending on the co-crystals of sildenafil that you could use in there we've got other forms so you, you can mix and match different elements within that because it's the the key thing that we've got is the core coat technology with the different combinations and the fact that it get part of it goes sublingual yeah but That's nobody else can do that fiddling and mixing and matching you've got the whole broad spectrum that we will have that broad spectrum assuming our, our pattern as it goes through the process we'll be arguing with the examiners exactly what we get so you might find it narrowed down a bit but it was we're still looking to have quite a broad approach for that core and that coat 
I'll give you another example. There are other ways of essentially doing things. So you can take a, a capsule. So you might take a longer lasting, you know, remember, I mean, but you might remember Contact 400, so a product that was around, which is like a capsule with lots of little beads. So you could put a long lasting bead in and a faster acting or normal acting bead. But what you won't be able to do is to put that under the tongue and bypass the stomach. So you, all you'll get there is normal and long lasting. You won't get fast, normal and long lasting. It's that core coat that's absolutely unique because you can't just do a layered tablet. You can't have a bottom layer that's long lasting and a top layer because how do you then put that, which layer do you end, end up getting through the buckle wafer? So that's why we have that protection on quite a broad area. Hi, you talked about the experience management team and your scientists from GSK, but what's your own background? My background, I'm uh, from Boots originally. So I was at Boots for 15 years, um, head of medicines, head of product development for vitamins. Um, and I've got a consumer background, a consumer product development background. So in essence, what I'm trying to do with, with pharma is to develop a consumer mind thinking. So the real issue for Vagra is develop a product that gives people a normal sex life. That's what, that's what people want. So particularly as the market now is moving towards OTC, so Pfizer, Pfizer have switched Viagra OTC. Um, in my, one of my earlier presentations, we talked about, there's about 100 million people that suffer from some form of erectile dysfunction. And one of the ways that Pfizer argued that it was better that they switched OTC is so that they could control that untapped market rather than it be on the internet, go to Boots or Lloyd's and actually get your product there. So all that market that will be coming you know, through to the OTC sector, having a product that works better for you gives a huge opportunity as well. Sorry, one, one more question occurs to me. There is another company on the market which is in phase three trials for a glycerol trinitrate gel formulation yep. for external application. Um, do you see that, that product success as a major competitor threat or is Cialis going generic uh, a bigger threat? Um, no, I, I don't see either as a big, a big threat for this new product because I think the key thing with our product is it's a tablet. So compared to a cream, I think a cream has got a very strong role in the market, but it's a, it's a completely different product. That's a physical reactive product. So you apply the product and it causes a reaction. It's completely different to sildenafil, which is where you need to have it in your system so that you can have a normal, natural sex life. So I, I see that as for a, a use that's there for if you've got quite serious erectile dysfunction, that's where I see creams and gels being used. Cialis switching is just going to broaden the market as well. Because what it, what it will do is focus on longer last. But again, back to the earlier question about my time, I did a lot of work on nicotine replacement therapy when I was at Boots, which is um, patches. You don't want a patch working while you're asleep. Similarly, you don't need an erectile dysfunction product working while you're asleep. So having a 12 hour, 15 hour profile is perfect for that product. So I see it as we've got a real point of competitive difference for our partner who wants to sell this product worldwide to be able to compete with generic Cialis and generic Viagra. I think your slide said you had 12 um, people in this, in this trial. Um, doesn't seem very many. No, this is our what? initial proof of concept trial. We've got, so basically, we've done the in vitro work, so we've done all the mathematics to say this is what we think will happen. That red line that I showed, we've got that profile targeted with our in vitro formulation. What we now have to do is measure that in humans. So with 12 people, that will give us enough of a read. We will then be able to take that, work, that results and you work out with statisticians and say, right, you might need 40 or 50 people in your final study. And that's what we take to the FDA and say, based on this data, we're going to propose to you a study with, say, 50 people. And then it gives you the statistical significance that you'll need to get the, the marketing authorization. So we're at what we call human pr proof of concept rather than pivotal. So the pivotal study is the one that will be the largest study, but not two, 300 patients. Um, could you say a little bit about your, um, what you expect your revenues to to do, where they come from, and obviously not the numbers, but... No, our revenues are, so our revenues are to come from licensing deals. Um, so we're looking at both Nuvec and Sildenafil. So we're looking to license Sildenafil to a partner for upfront milestones, um, royalty payments, ultimately. And the same with Nuvec. Each time somebody wants to take a, a product into clinic using our Nuvec, they'll be paying us 
money as they go through the clinic and ultimate royalties when the product hits the market. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.